Hi, I'm Will Webb, and this is Why You Should Watch. In today's episode, we're looking at The Diving Bell and The Butterfly, the 2007 drama directed by Julian Schnabel. Before we get started, if you aren't subscribed yet, then make sure you are so you don't miss out on another cracking episode just like this one. And if you could leave a review and rate the podcast, that would be incredibly appreciated. Okay, on with the episode. Jean-Dominique Balbi awakens in his hospital bed, unable to move or speak, and only able to see through one eye. His medical team explained that he had a stroke and is suffering from locked-in syndrome. Then, a new method of communication opens up Balbi's ability to describe his inner world. Joining me to discuss the movie is Ed Lovelace, director of the newly released documentary Name Me Lawand, out in the UK today and distributed by the BFI and playing across all sorts of cinemas, Picture House, View, Odeon, you name it. Ed has a long and varied career in docs and fiction and brings that understanding to a fascinating chat about a movie that plays with both. Hi Ed, how are you doing? Hello, well, how are you mate? Thank you for having me. No, thank you. I'm, I'm, it is Ed, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For some reason, when it's written on screen, it's Edward, but it's Ed to my, to my friends and family, mate. So I'm including you in that. As a director, you always want to have a name that looks good where the first bit is a bit shorter than the surname, like if it's in big block type, right? Yes. So it's not Steve Spielberg, it's Steven. Like there's a right ratio for that to yeah, be. Yeah, true, right? yeah. So Lovelace, you know, you need, you can't just put Ed there because then it'll look tiny along like the tip <laughs> exactly. of the pyramid. Exactly. You need Edward Lovelace. Yes, yeah. true, true. There wasn't that much thought into it, but it just kind of, once I just saw it, someone else wrote it, I was like, oh, let's just go with Edward. I go by William Webb on my films and never William in my life now. Like no one, uh, no one calls me William, I think, in my entire family anymore. So yeah, that's it. Yeah, it always makes me laugh when like filmmakers that I know that, um, that, I haven't seen for a while and then I like I, I see a film they've made and suddenly they've got this like weird on-screen um presentation of their name and I'm like that's not your yeah. that's not your name you come up with this like you know film friendly name but yeah the persona exactly mate yeah well I had that with this because the director is an American guy but he's predominantly made his films in Europe um and in, in fact in think I think exclusively in France I believe he's French American or he has some kind of French background but I was originally like Schnibel, yeah. uh, but he is in fact Schnabel. Yes. It's exactly as it's as it's as it yes. looks. Um, but yeah, it's such a joy to um, kind of chat about this film. It's an interesting pick when it came through. I'm always fascinated by what people pick, um, and your one because we, we talked about one other film, didn't yes. we? We talked about the yeah. Arbor. Yeah, uh, yeah. Basically, like there's. I think when you when you make a film, maybe you're suddenly aware of your references a bit more you know I mean, because you're not always are you, are you watching the films that influence you like they're there in the back of your brain but you're not putting yeah. them on every night because you're into something new and um but i guess just because this film's coming out now i'm remembering like oh whilst we were making it what films was i sort of going back to as my reference points yeah and the arbor was definitely one and we were going to talk about the arbor today i think maybe Diving Bell and the Butterfly is just like the main referential point for me, basically. So that felt like the one, but The Arbor's a beautiful film. And I rewatched it the other night. It was, it was you know, it's a tough subject to, to, to re-experience that film, but it's beautifully made and yeah, she's great. I do feel like sometimes those really influential films for you also tend to be the ones that are really grueling. And so like, they're not often your favourites. Like I, I, there are some films that really influence me that I never want to watch again. Uh, and, you know, like, I, I think both of the films you talked about, The Arbor and also this one, do have that really, like, tragic element uh, that's quite difficult sometimes. But I should also say that, like, as someone who watches very little feature documentary, it's great that you chose two films that kind of play with a real subject in interesting ways on screen. Um, but we'll get into that. I mean, I could immediately see the commonalities between Diving Bell and the Butterfly and your film. But maybe it's better just to just to give a bit of context to the audience about Name Me Lawand. I wonder if you could just introduce roughly what the film is and what it's about. Yeah, Ace. Yeah, so Name Me Lawand is a film about a kid called Lawand. Uh, he's Kurdish. He grew up in northern Iraq and he's deaf and he didn't have any access to like a deaf education or a language, a sign language, um, or like a deaf identity, essentially, in northern Iraq where he grew up. So he got when he got to the age of seven, uh, well, six, 
six slash seven basically his um he didn't have any language and his family decided to leave northern iraq and try and travel across europe and find somewhere where he could get support basically and they ended up in the uk and were taken in by this really beautiful school um the royal school for deaf derby which is a british Island language school and there lawand learns language for the first time learns bsl i guess discovers his identity and in many ways a deaf identity and the film basically charts his sort of dream to learn language but then also becomes about him being able to stand up to the home office and sort of fight for his right to stay in derby to continue to learn basically yeah of course and that's a story that is still kind of ongoing and is is uh, very much in common consciousness right yeah. now talking about people's right to stay in yeah. the uk um and so it was interesting that you chose diving Bell and the butterfly which is a fiction film um because when i watched lawand i was kind of struck by uh, how poetic it feels at points and it doesn't feel like I think I'm kind of in the last generation that grew up with documentary as like people sat down talking into a camera kind of documentaries and there's been a real shift into this creative non-fiction sphere uh, over the last I'd say about 20 years probably um, in the feature documentary space uh, and you also had a, a DOP who's better known for his narrative work as well is that right? Yeah yeah Ben Forsman yeah I think my relationship with documentary is like you know I think that the, the form of documentary is something that I have a load of opinions about. I think like it's often is quite limiting because in fiction movies, we have lots of genres, don't we? And obviously when you pitch a film, you're like, oh, it's sort of a horror, but it's got, uh, you know, or, but it's like a romantic comedy at the heart of it, or it's a, it's a drama, but it's actually got uh, like a thriller esque to it. And you can play with those genres and the audience are, are almost wanting you to bend the rules because people love films that sort of, you know, present as one thing and then end up being about, then end up sort of taking on a different form. So when you're, when you're writing fiction, which I do a little bit of as well, basically I feel like it's completely limitless. You can do whatever you want to do. The POV of your story, you can do, you know, there are, there, it feels like there are no rules. In documentary, there's this sort of expectation for it to be a certain way. Like, for example, on the film I made before Luand, one of the producers who kind of came on board on their first day, they were like, right, so when are we shooting the headshot interviews? And I can't see that in your schedule. So we can't make the film until we shoot the headshot interviews. And obviously just for the listeners, what we mean by that is like a, is, is an interview like this when you're, when your protagonist is essentially is just being interviewed about their story. And um, I was like, Oh, well, I, I would, I would never shoot a head. I'm not saying I would never do it, but in terms of my film language, that's not in my film language. I wouldn't do that. So I guess basically what I'm trying to say is that documentary, there are these rules that I guess the audience and then in turn filmmakers feel like that they're, they're, they're there are rules in place that you have to stick by. Otherwise, you know, it's not a documentary. So I think that that I've always, I haven't struggled with that. I've just completely discarded that ever since, ever since I like figured out my storytelling voice, which is definitely connected to the first time I saw Diving Bell, as well as another bunch of films when I was younger um, that I consumed. I basically was like, well, I feel like there are, there is a style of film to be made mine will be documentary because they will be about a real person, but the form of the film will be limitless. And as long as I'm staying true to a truth and obviously the voices in the film, like the protagonist in the film obviously has to be real because that, that, that is a documentary. Then what we shoot can be, why does it have to be a certain way? So I think I've I've I think I the idea of the word documentary I think it's it's limiting because it's one word that represents all these different types of films and every time I watch a feature doc yeah. I really feel like oh well that filmmaker is doing something completely different to this filmmaker and and then everyone's it's so broad but there's this sort of there's a slight constraint basically and obviously then now you have like I guess the brand of like the Netflix documentary which you know we're all into on some degree it kind of works and when you turn on a netflix documentary you sort of know what it's going to be and, and that works because people like to know what to expect and you can come back for more and that's great but again i think that's just another step that's another that's another like loop of this expectation of documentary being sort of one thing i guess it's not it's not dissimilar to like the way that animation is talked yeah, about sometimes definitely. where like you'll often see, I think it's um, um, Lee Unkrich, who's one of the people at Pixar's brain trust uh, often says that he'll punch someone if they call animation a genre. 
because of course you can tell all sorts of animation stories and animation is really just the medium through which the stories are told and documentary likewise as you say we sometimes think about like comedy documentaries and you often get this kind of like heartwarming like kind of labels attached but yeah i haven't seen a doc that i've seen described as a thriller yeah except for maybe like the imposter yeah, and stuff exactly. like that, which is already quite far into the fiction yeah realm. completely yeah yeah and i think i think um yeah i mean the imposter is like you know it's such an amazing film and that sort of really pushed the boundaries of what we expect from you know a, a, like a true story i think any film that does that i'm just all for it because basically yeah. Even the most conventional documentaries, the moment you're making any decisions, you are you're putting your vision into them. So once you're doing that, as again, like I said, as long as you're staying true to your protagonist and the audience know what you're watching on screen is authentic and real, I feel like it should be limitless and that and that's sort of joyful. And, and to be fair, the the people that I choose to make films about and with, I think there's like a sort of I think maybe by well it's, not, well, it's not a coincidence, but I, I guess I don't. I don't know that that that's what I'm searching for at the beginning. But but the commonality between all my protagonists is that they're quite artistic, ambitiously creative people. Even if like Luan, Luan's a 13 year old kid. He's he's not. I wouldn't say he's artistic. Uh, you know, he loves sort of football and kind of like less artistic things. But he, in the way he thinks, he's quite artistic and quite quite ambitious. So he was like, I really want the film to be visual and like, Ed, all of your ideas, I want you to go away and kind of visualize my story in a way that's going to be, that is going to, is going to be kind of unique basically. Yes. Yeah, so I think, I think if you're someone that, yeah, I think I end up basically finding protagonists that I think want that, you know, they don't, they don't want like a documentary that sort of, I guess, focuses on the like nuts and bolts of their everyday life, but rather tries to sort yeah, of plug sure. the audience into their like inner landscape somehow. So let's rewind a bit and talk about Diving Bell and the Butterfly. How did you first come to see it? Because you said it was quite an influential moment, I guess, for you seeing it for the first time. Yeah. So I saw that film at, at uh at university at film school i guess you know i was meeting all these new people and, and everyone had their like you know their sort of you know i was i was like mega into like french new wave films so maybe that was the thing that i sort of took to film school and was like convincing everyone to watch those films and some people had watched them and some people hadn't watched them and then everyone else sort of had their little pocket of of cinema that they loved they were sort of bringing to the table so i was experiencing all these new films and i i think really like Gus Van Sant's Elephant um, that came out the first year I was at film school in 2003. I think that film really made me think, oh, wow, like this feels like unlike anything I've ever seen before, just in like its form and how like, yeah, just how it was executed. It made me feel a certain way. And I definitely watched that film and thought, okay, that's like the first time I could, truly think that i might be able to make a film because i was like well I, that is definitely representative of of how i would see cinema somehow um and then when i saw yeah diving Bell and the butterfly i guess it was the first time i'd seen a film that basically sort of placed the audience inside the pov of a character yeah at, and didn't and it's quite literal right we're just to be clear to the viewer like we're, we're it really literally places you within the physical body of the main character yeah. for about half of the film's runtime. It's about 45 minutes before you get any sustained outside of his POV shots in the yeah, film. Yeah, exactly. And obviously it's about, yeah, this guy that wakes up, um, you know, having had a stroke and he's sort of like got lo locked in syndrome, I guess. So we're basically literally looking out of one of his eyeballs to, into this hospital room and he can't communicate yet. We can't communicate any sort of he's learning like the audience basically were experiencing it as he experienced it. And I think the thing that made me think about movies was one, this is super powerful basically and quite brave to not, to, to basically avoid the classic thing of like, we need a wide shot and a mid shot to establish things. But yeah. rather this film was saying, oh no, we're just going to experience something from, through one person's POV and that's going to be limiting, but there's going to be some, special truth that we're going to discover and, and by by not doing those like big establishing storytelling uh techniques we're going to somehow actually teach the audience something um 
so that was the first thing. The second thing was it really made me think in a different film about someone that had, had locked in syndrome, we would be looking at them, we'd be looking at this person. Yeah. And we would be putting judgment on them, I guess. And we would be looking at them and thinking like they are, there's a limitation to them because they can only move their eyes. But I guess this, because this film put it, put you inside this person's brain, it, I guess it gave, it gave the protagonist the power and it, and it sort of said to the audience, you're going to see the world. You're not going to look at this person. Instead, you're going to see what they see. I think that became, mm. I guess, subconsciously for me, but now looking back, that became, and then now has become like a real sort of mantra for me. You know, in, yeah. in Luand, there was like lots of discussion of like, there is, there is this huge story and there are so many people involved that, that helped Luand on his journey and they would be great storytellers in this film and they would help the audience understand the scale of the story but if they all speak then whose pov is it and somehow by mm. limiting the perspective to just the voices of Luand and his family we even though we will be creating challenges for ourselves because we can't get a wider perspective we will somehow get closer to to like a truth basically i think that yeah, absolutely. yeah that just became that became something that i just really loved and also in diving bell because you were sort of limited because you were trapped inside of this pov which obviously is which is what that character went through when you were able to break out and when i say break out i mean just in his imagination and just in the way this character would learn how to communicate that was so joyful and so emotional mm. that I, I i just started to think wow this is by limiting your audience you, or, or i guess by asking the audience to go through in a really immersive way what someone else has gone through when they experience sort of moments of joy you are genuinely experiencing it alongside them and i just thought that was that was super powerful sometimes i'm struck by when i'm talking to uh, like what i would say like non-film ministry people sometimes there's a bit of confusion about what a director actually does and i think the diving bell and the butterfly is a really good way of explaining it to people because it is an ostensibly true story um i mean we're the film's really an adaptation of the book that the main character wrote yeah, so like it's debatable about the truth of it. And one of the things that's interesting about it is that it really seems like Julian Schnabel is also not particularly interested in, as you say, the nuts and bolts of the story. Like there's very little explanation of the facts of what actually occurred to uh, Jean-Dominique Balbi is the name of the guy, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so that's fascinating because y you end up with a very clear example of where a director made specific choices about how the story would be told um, that are really bold. So like there's an easy version of this that could have been made as like a 90 minute TV movie that's about like a brave dude dealing with a disability. And it's, it's purely the director intervention that makes the film a more interesting version of that. Obviously that's responding to the very, very interior text. I read some samples of the book. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really strong stylistic choice. And you said um, something interesting, which was like you said, putting the audience through that and that first 20 minutes does feel like a physical kind of experience. Uh, so when we say POV, it's not like a nice, cleanly recorded POV either. Um, it's mostly recorded using tilt shift, right? When you put a lens in front of the camera and kind of like tilt it in and out of orientation. So the elements yeah. come in and out of focus during the shot. And I think it's supposed to simulate his left eye being the only working thing. So there's kind of changing depth perception, uh, the inability to focus and things like that. And it made me feel seasick uh, for a while watching it. Um, but I think that's quite intentional. It's supposed to feel like jarring and disorienting. And I was struck by even when you do see some out-of-body recollection stuff in that first uh, hour of the film, even those out-of-body sequences are largely shot from behind the actor, Matthew Almerich. So you're still sort of like with him or seeing things roughly from his perspective. Yeah. And they're also weirdly like big, long sweeping shots that have quite a lot of energy in comparison to the rest of the film. I think we're not supposed to take them as like a literal POV that he's remembering, but sort of like a fantasy of the remembrance because that filmic language sticks around for the rest of the, of the film as well in the other Definitely. recollection scenes. Um, and yeah, I, I was also, I was sat there. So, so I, I should explain about my background for Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Um, so 2007, when it came out, I would have been, I think, 14, 15. So it was like the, the period of your life where if you're interested in films, you start to actually like, 
seek out stuff to watch. And it was a big Oscar buzz film that year. So I have a distinct memory of looking at the synopsis for it and thinking, no, I don't want to see that. That film sounds boring. The guy sat in a bed for two hours. Like, and I was imagining, I think, that 90-minute made-for-TV movie version of the film that you would get if you just did the plot. But of course, it's, it's a majorly stylized film instead. Um, and weirdly, the thing that it really brought to mind when I was watching it was um, a load of French filmmakers who are mostly working a decade before Schnabel, which is um, the Cinema de Luc films. So I don't know if you're familiar with this, like Luc Besson, uh, Jean-Jacques Benex, um, Leos Carax. And I was fascinated to find out yeah, that Jean-Jacques Benex actually did a film about Balbi when he was still alive. Oh, really? Yeah, so there's a half-hour documentary. Um, when you when you said the diving bell the butterfly, I was like, I hope you don't mean the, the half-hour documentary that's never been released. Oh in the no, UK. okay, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so it was done, I think, on behalf of the publishers or like for a news magazine show. So Jean-Jacques Benex did like four films that were really well received. So he made Diva, which is like really good thriller. Uh, he made Betty Blue, which has a French name, yeah. which is like thirty-two degrees on a Sunday morning, something like that. Um, and, and then he basically stopped, he made about three fiction films and then just went back to doing documentaries. He's always done TV doc. He just went back to doing it. Um, so I don't know when this is in that timeline. I think it's just before he makes his first feature, um, fiction feature, but yeah, so he made a half hour film, uh, with Balbi, um, before he died. And it was uh, only about three months before the book came out, which is when he died. Basically, uh, he died two days after the book came out. Um, yeah. so it's, it's interesting. I, I'd love to track down and have a look because a lot of this film's language feels like it's riffing off that. And I don't know if it's just because it's French or because of that kind of like era of filmmaking, but yeah. they loved that, um, all that stylistic experimentation because away from the POV stuff, every other sequence that has these kind of fantasies in them is very playful. You have um, an empress and ballet dancers in a 1900s hospital that turns into an operating room that's full of like broken statues. And then you have, the underwater sections and nature footage and all this kind of stuff mixing in. So for people that haven't seen that film, you know, so he wakes up in his hospital bed, can't communicate. And obviously with these nurses, like figures out between himself and the nurses that he can, with his, with blinking, basically, he can tell them what letter he wants to pick and then create a word and create a sentence and essentially begins sort of writing the beginnings of what is this book, basically. And I think the, the first time the film uh, expands beyond the physical the physical boundaries of his situation um, is when the nurse, like, it's as if the nurse is reading back to him the first sort of, like, you know, piece of writing that, like, they've got to the end of, like, you know, a chapter or a section of words. And it's like, th then he is able to, like, freely read it and voice it. And then the... I guess the POV of the film goes out of his body and then can like, you know, float elegantly down the halls of the hospital. And like, there are no rules because obviously it's just his imagination. Like the film is just visualizing words that he wants to communicate ideas that he has in his brain. And obviously that I was like, what I was blown away by that. I, I started to be like, right, this is a really um, like what this film is about. And who is it about? And the story is not abstract at all. It's about someone who's woken up with a condition that is is so serious and um, and black and white. It's it's like there in all its sort of um, painful reality. But basically, the film has allowed the person to dictate what the audience sees. And, and I think like the film really successfully gets the audience to feel the emotions of the person basically and, and then it and then the, and the film kind of uses all these different filmic filmic tools i guess to like visualize the words that he writes and, and that i started to think obviously like the, the film i made before naming the wellness is called the possibilities are endless which is about edwin collins um the scottish musician who wrote who who write his big hit i guess was um uh, a girl like you, never met a girl like you before. And where, so he had a stroke, and when he woke up, he didn't he didn't know that he, yeah his memory had been affected, and he didn't know that he was a singer. Like his wife was playing him records, and he was like, I don't know who this is, and it was him, and he couldn't uh, communicate. And the doctors basically said, we're not gonna allocate you um, 
speech and language uh, support, basically, because we don't think you'll be able to like fully communicate again. And he so sort of did it. So then he basically just had this massive sort of life changing moment and and just and l- taught himself how to, how to talk again and then taught himself how, how to sing again and then he started to write music again over the course of, of like a few years and, and myself and my co-director on that film jay james all we made this film with edwin about his experience and that film was, was yeah, that had the same same perspective as diving bell really I, we, yeah, we said to edwin don't worry edwin we don't want to come and film the harsh reality of your day to day. We want to make a film that allows the audience to to connect with what's inside of you. And mm. you don't want to be limited physically, but you are, but your imagination is completely free and, and limitless. So let's show the audience your imagination, basically. And and then I think Edwin was like, that's that is exactly what I want. That I, I want the audience to know what's in my brain, what's in my heart. Not not I don't want the audience to look at me and like have any sympathy for me because if they could understand what is in my brain they'd be you know they 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 they'd, they'd, they'd connect with me on a different level i guess and so then that that's that's how mm. that film was made and then Mamie Lewand, i guess has a has a similar pov in places basically because obviously the idea is that as Lewand's learning language he has all these big ideas about his place in the world and how he sees the world and his opinions on the world and how he would want planet earth to be in the future and so i was like right amazing let's go away and visualize that in the same way that they see in diving bell these kind of sequences play out and the audience are allowed to experience a character's dreams basically and that's the commonality with lawan that i was really struck by watching diving bell the butterfly is that fundamentally uh this film is about communication because you have a character who is very very rich internally the opening sequence where he's being told about his doctor by his doctors about his condition is kind of underscored by a voiceover that's kind of his internal thoughts, but he literally cannot communicate that that very rich like internal life to these doctors. And then this code, this system of blinking and looking at letters, allows him to open that voice back up again. And that really made me think of Lawand, where the story is so much about uh, this kid having like every kid like a rich inner life, but then not being able to communicate it until language kind of steps in. And as you say, like that's almost um, a way that Lawan then starts to connect with the world when he has access to it. Um, yeah, and also yeah. I think that like the way that's told in Diving Bell is also similar in some ways to Lawan because I notice watching your film that um, the the sound mix kind of fills out as the film goes on. It's not that it's mixed so that it's like um, it's not like it goes from mono to stereo or something like that, but it's more like it, it layers more as you go through and I. Talking to Fleur, your producer, uh, that was a, a very intentional thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The idea was basically in the beginning of the film, I wanted the audience to know what it felt like for Lawan to basically be somewhere where he couldn't communicate. He didn't know where he was, why his family was suddenly on this journey, and he couldn't, um, I guess, he had all these feelings about himself and his identity and his and the world but he didn't know how to express himself basically and didn't know how to ask questions and wanted information i guess and that was obviously mega frustrating for him and in you know on such a crazy what on such a crazy level and obviously as he gains a language the world becomes like clear to him i guess and he's able to articulate his ideas and also like really that film is all about i guess the message of that film which is just the truth of what happened to the land is that when someone is when someone gets access to a language that they feel expresses themselves in a way that that is true to them then they have they have the power basically they have the power to make their own choices they have the power to be exactly who they want to be and until that happens that person is sort of caged i guess and i think i think for Luan, the moment obviously in the film there's one point where Luan yeah, he, he he attends this school in in Derby when he first comes to the UK, and at that school, it's, it's such a beautiful school, and they basically teach British Sign Language, but they also they also teach like verbal English, and obviously to to because they're just to be clear, they're they're different languages essentially, right? Like um, the way that that sign languages are structured is fundamentally different to verbal languages. It, exactly, yeah, the grammar of sign language is different to is different to spoken English. 
Um, and obviously to like, to, to a kid like Luan learning sign, he can learn it. Yeah. He's, he's obviously beyond fluent in sign because he doesn't, because, you know, he can just, he can just see the hand movements and then copy them perfectly and, and learn, and, and learn, and learn language. And obviously he's, he's a wizard at sign, but obviously because he's deaf, the, the, his, 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 the way in which he would learn how to verbally communicate is all down to like sort of muscle memory because he obviously can't hear the words. Um, and so, yeah, at that school, basically they're kind of like, they're like, uh, their motto at that school is that they want the kids to have the choice. They want the kids basically to be able to learn sign language and learn verbal English. And then obviously at a certain point, the school sort of says, you know, we want the kids to grow up and then make a choice about what language they, they want to communicate in. Um, and obviously the, the majority of the world is a hearing world who, and that the majority of the world communicate verbally. So that they're like, we want to give our kids the choice. With Lawand, there came a certain point when he'd learned enough, enough sign that obviously his personality was kind of growing and he felt like he had the sort of confidence and uh, I guess, yeah, I guess just like he had the power to sort of say in sign, I don't want to speak, like that doesn't represent who I am, but I can't make the jokes I want to make. Like basically, I guess his his ability to verbally communicate because it was limited, he was like, I can't be the full version of Luan, Luan that I want to be. But in sign, I can be like I can be everything I want to be. So, so really, that for the film, the message of the film is that when someone has the language that they desire, they have the power. They can they can make their own choices and basically just like you know go go live the life they want to live. Which obviously, again, going back to Diving Bell, like you know when he wakes up he has no power he has all these things that he wants to say back to the doctors and he can't he can't communicate it's so frustrating for him and for the audience and also he has such a big personality oh, the thing that struck me about diving bill when i first watched it i was like wow like the like he's got just such a a, a massively vivid personality and he's so funny yeah. and dark and it's about and 10 fast. minutes in you you get introduced to like his illness first which i think is quite an interesting choice it's almost like hey here's this disabled person and then it's like, by the way, I was editor of L. Like yeah, I was this this yeah, incredibly yeah, yeah. well known journalist in a really complex international environment, having loads of affairs. Like crazy, how many yeah, affairs people are having yeah, in this film? Yeah, Hard exactly. to keep track. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, and the way he like, you know, at the beginning, he isn't like, yeah, you know, he just like fancies the female nurses and just like how he communicates yeah. his personality. I, th- I think what's what, what what I think. Well, when I first watched it, I was like, oh. I guess before I'd seen that film, the idea of watching a film where the protagonist had a disability of any kind, I guess they'd always been framed a certain way. And like I think mm-hmm. the, the real the real issue is like the way films have been made about people with disabilities was that the films didn't let their personalities shine because the films were like buying into the way the world sees certain people. And I guess in Diving Bell the filmmaker like gave the microphone to to the protagonist and then yeah. then the protagonist has all the power the protagonist gets to be like you know you don't have a say in how you see me i'm going to tell you the world who i am regardless of um the fact that i'm in this hospital bed and i can't communicate but but he has the microphone essentially and i think and i just loved that the, 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 i guess the power that that, that character had um, and throughout, there's very little focus on like the disability itself. Um, so, like, the, obviously, like the, the central crux of it is that he can't talk, that he can't move. But there's not like um, these kind of aspirational stories about him getting better. Uh, there's bits and pieces taken from his his real life progress. So, like, he starts learning a song at one point that's not. Yeah. I don't think it's fully explained in the film, but he was taught to like grunt a song about kangaroos. So you can see his kids reciting it with him. Um, yeah. But yeah, like that kind of focus is kind of left out, uh, which is great because most disability stories on film, even now really, um, do tend to be either like an aspirational story or like faith-based quite often. So it's good to see something that's like almost just treats the stroke itself as just like an accident, like uh, like a terrible thing that no one could control and it isn't really the ultimate point of the story, which is quite refreshing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 100%. I think like, you know the the you know, I've made four feature docs, but the last two feature docs about Edwin and Luand. One of the kind of missions was like, how do we give 
Edwin all around. How do we give them the power so that the film that is being made is portraying them exactly how they how they see themselves, not how the world might might see them, basically, because of their like difference, I guess. Um, and that's interesting in that context because it's not a documentary, but it is mostly verbatim from the book, which was written by the guy. So it has that sort of character to it. That's why it was interesting when you mentioned the Arbor. Uh, in relation to this like almost there's something similar because the arbor also uses verbatim uh to take stories of real people and put them on in a fictional setting and so although this film's fictional it's largely a fiction that's been imagined by the person that it's about so it's yeah. Quite, yeah quite like an interesting structure for a story yeah exactly yeah and, and because we're, like as we're as we've been talking about the one film as the film has been released there's obviously like you know this has sort of come up with a few people uh I just did this I've been doing these interviews with um with Commode, with Mark Commode, which has been so fun and such a joy. And, and he was saying, Oh, Ed, all of your reference none of your references to documentaries. And I was like, I guess. I, I was like, I don't even think about it like that. I don't even think of I Diving Bell to me is not a movie where I would like put it in like the fiction space. And then the Arbor, I wouldn't like well, as I want I guess the documentaries that I love they just sit in this space of films and in that space there are fiction movies and documentaries and they're all together and I, th- I think the commonality between all those films I think is just POV I love this like we could have done another mm. podcast about the um Kurt Cobain film about a son I don't know if you've seen that film yes yeah yeah that film is so amazing because I guess like that film again is like you know all we do is like all we all we did when Cobain was here was look at him and, and all we do now that he's gone is look at him. You know, the world just looks at him and it's quite, it's how do you get someone to understand what it would have been like to be him and to experience, experience the world from his POV. I think when, when the one I saw about a son, what was so amazing was obviously that filmmaker had basically recorded, uh, you know, he, he got, that filmmaker got access to this journalist's, like four hour phone call conversation with Cobain a few days before he died. So all that film we could have was like an audio recording of a phone call conversation that was really honest. And Cobain was just being himself and talking about everything and talking about his story and how he felt about the world, his family. Um, And then the filmmaker basically went back to all the places that Cobain talked about in his story Mm. and basically filmed. Well, when I watched it, I was like, Oh wow. The filmmaker is sort of saying, this is what Cobain might have looked at. You know, the, when he was in, like the, the filmmaker yeah. obviously like researched and was like, oh, this is where Kurt worked and this is where he lived and this is the school he went to. Let's go and film, let's go and film a perspective that might show us what Cobain was looking at and then therefore experiencing. And obviously in that film, you really feel like you're sort of inside his POV because you're not looking at him. I don't think you ever see any images of any photos of him in that film. You just sort of see... It's as if you're. It's as if you're got access to like uh, a home movie camera that, that he shot. Do you know what I mean? Even the film's really beautiful and cinematic, but that's the sort of POV. And I think that makes you feel like. I think you, it just gets you closer to a character, and I think you yeah. start. Uh, you, 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 basically, what it does is that it, I think it takes you out of like the way in which society usually looks at someone, and instead it kind of says. To the audience, you can see this from the inside out, basically. So I think yeah, all those I guess it's like together, it's yeah. the difference between because there's different schools of how to approach a story, right? And most most films uh, are done in this kind of like the Hollywood the Hollywood approach is like what happens, um, but then the approach that you're talking about is to say instead of like what happened, it's like how did it feel? Like what was it like to experience it happening, as opposed to Definitely. just telling us the facts about what occurred. Um, Definitely. I, I, during COVID, I was so bored of writing. Like, any, I found it very difficult to write because I realized I'm kind of like a walking around looking at people writer. Um, but I, I decided I would write a period film because I'd never done it. And I thought, like, it's as far away as possible as I can get from now. Um, so I did something about Victorian London. And weirdly, the thing that helped the most is interesting that you said that about like just looking at the places that Kurt Cobain had been and maybe what he saw. Um, I did a lot of stuff on like, what would it have smelled like in Victoria, London? Like, what would they have eaten day to day? Because that was like an easier way of getting into their headspace than anything else. It's like, if you're eating jellied, pie, jellied eel pie, like on a regular basis, like genuinely, what's that like for your life? Like, how are you going to feel? 
Um, so yeah, I spent lots of time like reading menus and things from the era, um, which really helped get get in the shoes. That's yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's yeah. That as you were saying, about that really like I made this um this Katy Perry film, which was an uh, an odd experience, but anyway, that yeah happened. And I remember I was like working with this editor, and uh, you know he was like, "Oh, I know, I want to know like wh- what she's eating." Like, and I was like, "Oh, there's loads of footage yeah. of like," and this was when Katy was at like, the height of her fame, basically, and um uh, on this big world tour. That's what the sort of film was about. And he, this editor was like, you know, I want to know what her everyday normalities are. Like, is she eating pizza? Like, what, basically, what's she doing when, like, essentially the, camp, the, the POV is off her? And I think he was just like, I've really learned something from that. I was like, oh, like, to get the audience to understand the human away from the big sort of stage performer, that that's when we truly understand someone, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Also, a film that I feel like, I mean, I, I feel like my favourite cinema experience was watching, even though, I mean, I love this film, but it's definitely not in my, like, you know, it's not in my top five films or anything, but Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk, and I saw that at the IMAX cinema in London. Same. Obviously, lot, lots of that film. Intense experience in there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, did you watch it in the IMAX? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was like, I mean, lots of that film is sort of, I mean, that the whole idea of that film, I guess, is like, you know, like Nolan said, like, I didn't want the audience to have access to the sort of grown up conversations that the sort of leaders of the yeah. British it's army, like, it's like or um, the British government, three yeah, you're like perspectives of on the ground, essentially, right? Is the idea exactly, yeah, yeah completely, yeah, like, like if you're if you're Tom Harley's character, like, you're basically in you're in the cockpit of that of that plane and you don't really know much else. So once you're up there, that you're you're like limited to just that one POV. And obviously the the like the, the soldiers on the ground, when we're with them, there is no like, oh like you don't get access to like people in rooms kind of going, you know, there might this thing might happen or this thing might save these soldiers. You just get to experience it sort of minute by minute with them. And I remember being like, wow, that obviously Nolan was choosing to limit himself and the audience. Cause obviously it'd be a way when you're writing that film, it'd be way easier to be like, let's cut to, you know, church yeah. office yeah. with him making decisions so that we know what's going on. But rather by limiting the audience, I think you, you just experience a truth way, you know, you, you start to be re- like way closer to the protagonist. So I remember that film completely blown me away. Mm. And yeah, you know, I, I always say this, like I want to, I'm interested in watching and I want to make films about really big universal subjects, but I only really want to experience it through like one character so that sure, your, absolutely. your limit, your limitation somehow teaches you something that a broader perspective sort of can't, it, 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 I guess it's, just, yeah. I guess it's the like cinematic equivalent of like reading a big headline that sums up a load of people or a load of situations in one headline. And you kind of look at that headline and you kind of go, I sort of can't even really get my head around what that means. Whereas if you met a person who was going through that thing, whatever the headline's about, suddenly you understand it because you've got an actual human connection with someone, I guess. Ed, thanks so much for chatting. And can you remind the audience when Naomi Lawanda is out and where they can see it? Yes, thank you for having me, Will. That was a joy. Um, Naomi Lawand is out in cinemas in the in the UK and Ireland on Friday the 7th of July. Um, on the 5th of July and then the 19th, it's like sort of one night only at, at all the view cinemas across the UK. Wow, so you great. can watch it on, on the 5th in this sort of one night only view, viewer hosting us for one night. And then on the 7th, it's on like general release everywhere. It's in 156 cinemas. And then on the 19th of July is another one night only at view. So yeah, July. So it's two nights only. Done. It's two nights only, either yeah. side of a load of big general releases, but viewer basically hosting these like two nights only thing. Anyway. It's a lovely film and I'm, I hope everyone goes and sees it. They definitely should. I've decided the person I'm going to convert on this is my like mother-in-law, who I think is absolutely going to be convertible to uh, seeing this documentary. So oh, ace, she'll get to go ace. do it. That's one ticket for you. Ace, ace mate. Thank you, mate. Appreciate Have a good it. one. See you later. All right, mate. Cheers, Cheers. mate. Take Bye. it easy. To hear more conversations on film, check out the Indie Tricks podcast. Search Indie Tricks, that's I-N-D-I-E-T-R-I-X, I I know, it was 2008, wherever you listen to podcasts to get started. 